Thank you so much, Attorney General Scrimetti, for sitting down and joining us in studio. I really appreciate it. Um, I was in the courtroom yesterday, and I noticed you were sworn into the Supreme Court bar right ahead of oral arguments for really what for our audience has been following this case. But basically, I just want to underscore how important it is. It's the first time really the justices took up, I guess you could call it a trans rights case that uh, considers constitutionality in question, the, the Equal Protection Clause. And so the, the justices had one hour of oral arguments. It went, what, almost three hours? I don't know if you were like me. I was like, where is the restroom? I had to dart out of the courtroom as soon as it was over. Um, but what did you make of what you heard? Uh, what was that experience like? So the biggest takeaway was the length of the arguments. This is a case that potentially has significant precedential value. The justices know that, and they asked a lot of questions because they want to make sure they get it right. Uh, so I was I was heartened by the fact that they're taking it so seriously. Uh, I would expect them to, but there were probing questions from all around. And you know, there could always be a narrow opinion. There could always be something that uh, moves in an unexpected direction. Mm -hmm. But this is the first constitutional case addressing gender identity issues. And so the lower courts, even if it's written narrowly, the lower courts are going to be getting what guidance they can from it because they haven't had any guidance. Right. I mean, Bostock. Bo Bostock, very textual statutory case that I don't think really applies in this context. You know, the Biden administration has tried to read Bostock, Bostock very broadly. But if you actually read the opinion mm -hmm. and, and look at Justice Gorsuch's approach. Yeah. yeah. Uh, it's, it is written about specific language in Title VII, and I don't think you can import it here. So there's there's really not a lot of constitutional guidance at all right. for the lower courts. And I know the administration has been using Bostock, and just to, to remind our listeners, Bostock was about the Civil Rights Act. It had to do with LGBTQ workplace issues. I think there was um, like one gay man, one transgender employee, and it's basically unrelated to the equal protection question that comes before the court with your case. Um, but I know the Biden administration has tried to use that when it comes to like school locker rooms, school bathrooms. And so they even brought it up during oral arguments uh, yesterday. And so I was going to ask you um, about that specifically. Uh, why do you think that they've gone to Bostock? Is it because it's really the only precedent there is? Yes. I mean, Bostock is the only guidepost the Supreme Court has given for how to look at these issues. And so people are latching on to it because there's there's no alternative. Mm -hmm. uh, the lower courts are seeing a significant volume of litigation involving these issues. You know, things have changed so much in the last few years. And uh, we've seen a very aggressive use of our civil rights laws on sex discrimination to try to force some pretty fundamental changes involving gender identity. So locker rooms, uh, sports teams, absolutely pronoun use, uh, you know, some some pretty basic parts of day to day life, and Bostock is the only guidance the Supreme Court's given. So the lower courts are are seeing a lot of cases, and trying to figure out what the law is. It's really important that the Supreme Court gives them clarity, mm -hmm. which I think is why they granted cert in this case. Right, and I I guess especially because it went for I guess the Biden administration, it's one they're they're using every chance that they can, whether it's. Uh, sports issues, school bathrooms, or in, in this case. One of the aspects of yesterday that I everyone in the press section was paying attention to Justice Gorsuch, which I'm sure you know he's the one who authored Bostock. So the fact that he didn't ask any questions, I know I'm asking you to be a mind reader, but like, what do we make of that? I mean, my, I, I hesitate to speculate, mm -hmm. but... I think all of the justices were paying close attention and thinking hard about some pretty complicated legal arguments. You know, that gender identity doesn't map well onto the existing sort of civil rights architecture because you have sort of two layers. You, you're not just looking at sex discrimination because there's this other identity layer on top of it. So it's a little bit, it's a little bit hard to conceptualize. And I think even the vocabulary used is difficult. So I wouldn't read too much into, into questions being asked. I mean, the justices will have months to deliberate. And even if, you know, a lot of people think they know how the case is going to turn out. Mm -hmm. uh, but even if the justices show their hand and are pretty transparent, and I don't know that they are during argument, they, right. ha they have months to think it over, months to debate with each Try other. Try to and, encourage each other to take yeah. their side. Yeah. So, I, you know, you, you can't read too much into, <clears throat> pardon me, into the argument 
other than that they're thinking hard yeah. about these issues. So I, when I cover cases, I sit there and I like to um, keep kind of a little tally for myself from questions, okay? Like, who do I think is on the same page? And so I thought the questions that Justice Barrett asked uh, the Chief Justice, um, they seemed to be a little bit more difficult for the other side. So I thought that would bode well for, for Tennessee. Um, of course, Gorsuch was, was quiet. Kavanaugh kind of showed his hand a bit, I thought, um, where he, he was going. Um, with all that said, you know, I thought your side had more. I had more little names next to Tennessee, okay, when I left the courtroom. So if the justices were to say, to side with you, um, could hypothetically, with a Republican Congress coming in, could they look to Tennessee's law and implement something like that on a federal level? So it, it's it's possible they would try to, but there's a whole other set of constitutional issues there involving limits on the scope of federal authority uh, that are just totally unrelated to this case. So even if there's not an equal protection clause deterrent to states adopting these laws, uh, you know, we have sued the Biden administration a lot <laughs> over, uh, <laughs> over their, uh, their laws along these lines. And one of the arguments that we frequently make is this is outside the scope of federal authority. And I, it would not surprise me to see the Californias and New Yorks of the world bring a similar lawsuit uh, if the Trump administration did that. Now, I'm, I, I don't know how it will turn out, mm -hmm. uh, but I think there's a whole other dimension to this that makes it difficult to say a green light for Tennessee means a green light for a Republican Congress. Right. And so with Tennessee's law banning uh, transgender youth from having medical treatment related to puberty blockers, hormone therapy, surgeries, um, the, the question or what the Biden administration and ACLU really were pushing was under the equal protection that it's treating boys and girls differently because one could access puberty blockers when another one couldn't. But one of the things that I thought was that just Justice Thomas hit on that's like the overarching issue with the law is age. It's a restriction for minors. And so um, can you kind of expand a little bit on that aspect? And also then when we saw some of the justices on the liberal wing of the court bringing up issues like trying to equate it to interracial marriage laws that have been struck down, like barring, you know, I think it was Loving v. Virginia with a white man wasn't lawfully allowed to marry a black woman. How, how where was there any connection there? Is there not? So, you know, there's been a lot of commentary about that line of questioning. And, I, you know, I think some of it is, is a little unfair. Uh, I think the point that Justice Jackson was trying to get at was we have this case where you have uh, two people from different races and the law said that they couldn't marry someone from another race. And she's equating that to saying if you have two people of different sexes and they can't take the same hormone treatment, then that's facially sex discrimination. I think the problem there and the point that my exceptional solicitor general Matt Rice was trying to make is when you take a medical treatment, you don't just you don't just take drugs. Nobody just hands you drugs and says, take these. There's mm -hmm. always a condition underlying it. And to evaluate the use of medicine, you don't you, you have to look at the condition being treated. If someone has gangrene, cutting off their leg makes a lot of sense. If someone has a stubbed toe, it would be insane cut to cut their it. leg off. Yeah. <laughs> so and, and Matt's ex, uh, example was you can take morphine for serious pain relief that's different than giving someone morphine to kill them in a physician-assisted suicide. Mm -hmm. And with the hormone treatments, boys' and girls' bodies are different. They are fundamentally different. They're affected differently by hormones. And that's where the confusion in this comes in. That's why there's this sex discrimination argument from the other side. But it's not, it's not, um, it's not some arbitrary fact. It's just fundamental. Every yes. human being is male or female and males and females have different interactions with drugs sometimes. And one of the things that, um, I don't know if you saw, but it was, I. now that everything's live streamed, you think, oh, people probably listen to oral arguments via audio when they're happening rather than in the courtroom, right? Because we don't have video in there. But Justice Kavanaugh's face, um, it was interesting to me because the uh, Biden administration Solicitor General, she actually acknowledged what you just said, that fundamentally but there is a biological difference between male and female and I remember I was looking at Justice Kavanaugh at the time and his eyebrows went up and then he followed up with questions about um, you mentioned previously like 
how that then applies to how they could rule in this case, how would that impact issues like women's sports with transgender athletes trying to keep, compete with women's sports? What was your take on how that was posed? You mean the women's the sports, women's sports question? issue? Like, for example, if they were to rule against Tennessee, what would that mean for women's sports? Well, if they rule against Tennessee and find some sort of heightened constitutional standard, it means the states will have an uphill battle uh, in, lower keep, courts. In, in lower courts keeping biological boys out of girls' sports. Mm -hmm. um, and Justice Kavanaugh was a basketball coach. Uh, this is something that matters a lot to him and that he's very familiar with. So, I, you know, I can see why that would be. And coaches his daughters, I think yeah. it was, right? He's, yeah. Yeah. So that, that's, it makes sense to me that that's the context he's concerned with. You know, if they, if they say that there's a heightened level of scrutiny here or if they identify um, transgender status as a protected class, it's going to insert the courts a lot more into these other policy decisions Whereas if they say rational basis applies, there's no constitutional violation here, it doesn't guarantee an outcome. It means democracy makes the decision. Mm -hmm. The people elect their representatives and they decide. And that was something I think the Chief Justice hit on about democracy. <coughs> also, um, Justice Kavanaugh, he, I think he said something like, doesn't that sound like let democracy uh, address this, especially when we're talking about moving science. And that was my next question was, I've covered the court since 2017, and very, very rarely do the justices talk about what other countries are doing or laws in other countries. So I found that extremely interesting. They, uh, I think it was Justice Alito, Justice Kavanaugh, maybe it was the Chief Justice. It, several times questions came up about Sweden and the UK that they have actually pulled back on uh, medical treatment for transgender youth. And they've cited various reports and studies about the risks, um, the damage done. Can you, like, how significant is that? And also there's there was talk a lot about like the harms that from some of these uh, young people who are taking these drugs, what this means for them, like infertility. Can you expand on that too? Yeah, so um, starting with Europe, I think the European example is hugely important because it makes clear that this is not an American culture war issue. The UK and Sweden are not red states. They do not have the values that Tennessee right. has. They don't have the other policies we have. They don't have the electorate we have, but they looked at the evidence. And even though these were countries that had enthusiastically adopted these treatments for kids, when they went back and they looked at the evidence, they realized that the risks dramatically outweighed the benefits mm -hmm. and they severely restricted access. There's still, access in certain very limited contexts um, or there are, there are age limits that differ a little bit from ours, but they've gone from being very open to this treatment to much, much, much more cautious about it. And that's an indicator for everybody looking at this objectively that it's not just a red-blue culture war battle. What are some of the issues, like I know on the other side they talk about like, oh, without these drugs there's increased suicide for trans youth. I don't know if that's disputed with other reports or if, um, you know, like we talked about infertility. What are some other, I think I've heard, what are some other medical conditions that uh, children could have if they take these, like hormone therapies? Yeah. So it's, it's, it's got a very, very significant impact on kids. Now the suicide issue, I want to address that first because it's really important. We don't want kids to kill themselves. I mean, we, gender dysphoria <laughs> is hard. Regardless of what we do in terms of treatment, it is a hard thing for a kid to deal with. Most kids will outgrow it, but while they have it, that's cold comfort. It is a difficult life to live. Uh, and for a long time, the narrative was, you have to let your kids transition. You need to get them on these drugs. You need to get them on the road to permanent transition because otherwise they'll kill themselves. And the line was, you, know, you can have uh, a live son or a dead daughter. And it was a horrific way to address parents. It put them under such pressure. awful pressure. The most important thing that happened in oral argument from my perspective was a colloquy between Justice Alito and Chase Strangio in which they acknowledged, uh, Strangio acknowledged Justice Alito's point that these treatments do not reduce suicide for mm -hmm. kids. Which he was the lawyer representing the ACLU, which has plaintiffs that are transgender youth for our audience that are following this. So that was interesting that he acknowledged that. And, and because suicide is in part driven by these social contagion factors, the narrative matters. And it's important that we get out there that it is not an inevitable path to suicide if we block kids from getting these treatments. But in terms of the biological impact, 
um, you know, if you give a boy with a testosterone deficiency testosterone, it ensures that he's going to grow up with functional fertility and avoid health problems. But if you give somebody, uh, if you give a girl testosterone, then there's the potential there for uh, lifelong loss of fertility, mm -hmm. for lifelong loss of sexual function, uh, for, and the conditions vary somewhat if it's a boy or a girl receiving the cross-sex hormone, but blood clots, tumors, uh, puberty blockers can cause fertility problems and serious bone density deficiencies. And all of them can cause cognitive development impairments. So you're talking about really serious lifelong consequences for kids who are put on these drugs. Um, I have talked to my readers about this really being the, the blockbuster case of the term. Uh, any guess, June, is this one of the ones that they hold on to until the very end before recess? I would be shocked if we got this early. Uh, I would not be surprised if it came very late, but the court's going to do what the court is going to do. I hesitate to guess uh, too aggressively about it. But given the significance potentially of the precedent, and even if the court tries to limit it, at least until they have another case, the lower courts are going to devour whatever they say. Uh, so I think they'll take a long time to make sure they get it right. Just off the top of my head, you mentioned um, the potential if the court were to create some sort of class for transgender uh, individuals uh, protection. That I think it was Justice Kagan who brought that up potentially. Do you think there's an appetite there to to do that with this, or would yeah, I guess this is since this is their first really transgender rights constitutional case they're taking up? Do you think they'll go that far at this point? Uh, the court hasn't identified a new protected class in something like sixty or seventy years. I think they're extremely reluctant generally to do that. Um, you know, I, again, I hesitate to predict too much. Mm -hmm. But that seems like a pretty unlikely scenario. Yeah, and I, I also recall, I think it was Justice Barrett who brought up, well, usually with that type of situation, there's a, a long case line of, or evidence of discrimination, and they, you, you don't really have as much with this respect that you do, for example, with race she was talking about. Um, you said, you know, we don't really know what they're going to do with this case. So there's a change of administration. This case is U.S. v. Scarmetti, right? So like with Trump coming in, the Trump DOJ presumably will take a different stance than the Biden DOJ in this. How does that impact where this case could go? Could the justices dismiss it as, you know, basically granted too early? What do you think? So the justices have a lot of discretion. They, they could do any of a number of things. But there's case law out there from the Supreme Court that as long as a party has litigated it, um, even if they're not the petitioning party, the case can continue. Here, the ACLU fully briefed the case. The ACLU argued the case on behalf of the private plaintiffs. And so even if the U.S. switches positions, that doesn't necessarily mean the case stops. Mm -hmm. And you would like to see, or I'm guessing you would like to see a ruling. Are you running to? I mean, we, we won below. Yeah. So, uh, but, I, but this is an area where there's just such a pointed lack of clarity. And we have a lot of cases involving gender identity mm -hmm. issues in Tennessee. We have a legislature that's very concerned about those issues. Well, I think also there's, we mentioned this, this women's sports, I think there's cert petitions from West Virginia and Idaho still pending on this issue. So I was also thinking maybe they're waiting to see how the court goes here in determining if they have to take up another another one. Uh, and, and that could be, uh, you know, the justices um, have many options in front of them and they get to make that decision. That's their role. Um, but I, I think sometime soon, if it's this case or another case, it would be very, very helpful for a lot of people litigating these cases. I mean, just in terms of the amount of money that's being spent, mm -hmm. because there's not a clear answer out there about some pretty fundamental constitutional questions, it would be great to get clarity. And with guide lower um, court judges as well. Like you mentioned, exactly, Bostock is really exactly. all they've had to go off of. I know Tennessee has been active with challenging the Biden administration in a number of areas. One I have covered was the student loan issue, uh, the student loan forgiveness from the Biden administration, which has taken different forms. Um, most recently, I think it, there was a recent announcement right before the election. Uh, how do you expect something like that to change with the changing administration? I know red state AGs have been very active with 
going after and challenging overreach from the Biden administration. How do you expect that to change in the coming years? Well, one of the reasons we've been so active is because what the Biden administration has tried to illegally do through regulation conflicts with our state policies and our state laws. If there's no conflict, we don't have standing to sue the federal government. Uh, what you might see, and if, of course, politically, I think it's really hard for a lot of people to push back against the federal government when it's doing what their side wants it to do. Mm -hmm. uh, but you might see some amicus briefs from the states uh, who, even if we agree with the policies that the federal government's pursuing, may want to note the limits on federal power because at some point, uh, the White House will change hands again. The, and, exactly, yeah. Uh, you know, limiting federal overreach is not sort of a short-term thing to stop one administration. It's a long-term project to ensure that the Constitution continues to be our system of government. And the Constitution provides an important but a limited role to the federal government, and it reserves the general police powers to the states. So we'll see how much stomach the Republican AGs have to do this. Mm -hmm. Uh, but it's a possibility and it's something I've thought about uh, because I think when you have the Californias and New Yorks pushing for limits on the federal government, that's a great opportunity to secure some long-term wins structurally. Uh, but at the same time, a lot of these are policies that are really important to us and right. to the people of our states. Uh, so that's that's something the to The line will be protecting states, state rights and from federal overreach. Um, my last question to you is I know you've done a media tour uh, talking about U.S. v. Scrimetti, like for the past, what, 24, 48 hours. <laughs> What's one question that you don't think is asked or you think there's a misconception out there that you want to address? So there have been a lot of concerns raised on the other side about limiting this to children. And there's a lot of fear that there will be a universal ban going after adults. And I haven't received a lot of questions about that, but it's clearly something that's important to a lot of folks. And I think if you look at the record in Tennessee's legislature, the focus was on kids, that they can't meaningfully consent to these life-altering procedures, that the risks are severely understudied at best. There's no evidence of benefits to kids. Uh, the number of kids on these treatments has exploded, mm -hmm. massive increase. And None I think also uh, cognitive development correct, was something that was correct. mentioned. Correct, um, With adults, none of those factors apply. And so even if legally, the standard is such that that's a possibility. Uh, I, I don't think, based on my observation of what legislatures are doing, I don't know that people need to be as worried about that as some of the rhetoric I've seen. Now, obviously, you know, people are entitled to their opinions. This is America. But this really, from our perspective, is a kid-focused case. The line here that we're defending is an age line, and kids are different than adults. There's a huge difference there. There's a huge difference in the state's role. Mm -hmm. uh, adults are much freer, and they're allowed to make choices that we disagree with that could have really bad consequences because they're in a position to make their own determination. We've recognized forever that kids can't make the same decisions. We don't let them get tattoos. We don't let them drink alcohol, Death consume penalty. tobacco. Yeah, they, I mean, they're contract limitations because we don't want to bind them in the future to decisions that they're not capable of making mm -hmm. uh, to the same extent that adults can. So this is a kid-focused case, and I, I, I think a lot of the fear about potential implications will possibly legally accurate, depending on how the opinion's worded. Um, I, I don't know that there's a lot of appetite to do that. Okay. Well, great. Thank you so much for coming here and answering our questions about this case. Um, I'd love to have you back. Maybe we can talk in July after we have an idea of where the court goes. We're all speculating about, oh, this justice made this face and this asked this question. But I guess we'll have to see what we get. We'll all see how wrong we were. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you.